Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sego ani buju wachaya kwe kwe. As the mayor of the city of Kingston, I offer these words in the spirit of this gathering. Let us bring our good minds and hearts together as one to honor and celebrate these traditional lands as a gathering place of the original peoples and their ancestors who were entrusted to care for Mother Earth since time immemorial. It is with deep humility that we acknowledge and offer our gratitude for their contributions to this community, having respect for all as we share the space now and walk side by side into the future. So with that, we will officially call this meeting to order. Madam Deputy Clerk, do we have a quorum? Mayor Patterson, we do have quorum. Okay, we have uh, nothing under Committee of the Whole closed meeting. Are there any adds this evening? Could I, could I just have a copy of the adds? Thank you. Okay, so we just have an amendment to a presentation and then we have a motion of condolence to add as well. Can I have a mover for the added, please? Moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor Osanek. Please vote. And that carries. Okay, uh, moving on, are there any disclosures of potential pecuniary interest? Okay, seeing none, uh, we move, move on. We do have one presentation this evening. Uh, Doug Jeffries, board member of the Kingston and District Sports Hall of Fame, will present the inductees for 2018. Mr. Jeffries. Good evening, Mayor Patterson, members of council and guests. On behalf of outgoing President Corey Abrams and the Board of Directors, it is my honor to present the list of five inductees who will formally become members of the Kingston and District Sports Hall of Fame at the 23rd annual dinner to be held on May 4th at the Ramada Hotel and Conference Center. I would like to publicly acknowledge and thank the members of the Selection Committee for all their hard work resulting in the list of five. The names will be read alphabetically, and as they're unveiled, the inductee or their representative may stand while the bio is read. And to save time, please hold your applause until all are introduced. Ross Cameron. Ross has competed, supported, and organized the sport of sailing locally for over 65 years. From 1979, he has been a board member of the Kingston Yacht Club and chairman of Cork, of course, the Canadian Olympic Training Regatta Kingston. They are from 1985 to 2003. He also initiated the Cork Youth Festival attracting over 500 novice sailors to Lake Ontario every year. Ross was instrumental in the development of the Ontario Sailing Race Management Training Program, and in 1992 received a Special Achievement Award for outstanding contribution to the field of fitness and amateur sports over a period of at least 10 consecutive years, and in the same year was given a Canada 125 medal from the Governor General of Canada. In 1995, Ross was recognized with Sail Canada's most prestigious award for contributions he made as a builder within the sport of sailing. Partnering with John Armitage, they proposed that Kingston host dragon boat racing. And from 1997 to 2014, Ross has acted as a scorer, on-site advisor, and site supervisor. He was chair of the board for the Kingston Dragon Boat Festival from 1998 to 2014. In 2002, Ross was instrumental in developing Kingston's bid for the Ontario Senior Games. And in 2005, he was named the prestigious winner of the Cork Volunteer of the Year, Ross Cameron. Hank Kelly. 
Hank has devoted over 50 years of his life to supporting sports in Kingston and other communities, either as a coach, manager, official, or administrator. After four years of coaching baseball in the Kings Court Little League, he formed a league for teenagers in 1964, and three years later, the Kingston Midget Baseball League added a juvenile division and served players from the ages 15 to 21. And during that time, Hank managed and coached two Eastern Ontario Baseball Association Midget Championship teams. In 1968, Hank spearheaded the formation of the Kingston Hockey Referees Association. He wrote an instructor's officiating manual in 1974, preceding the national program arrival in 78. Hank attained a Canadian Amateur Hockey Association Level 4 certification and refereed for three decades. He was also an Ontario Minor Hockey Association supervisor of officials from 1985 to 2000. Hank interrupted his local contributions in 1972 when he joined the World Hockey Association Cleveland Crusaders as an administrator and a scout. Hank received the Kingston 100 Award celebrating Kingston's hockey centennial in 1986 for individuals who have made an impact in the development and promotion of the game of hockey in Kingston. And in 1988, he was given the Government of Canada Celebration 88 Medal for his selfless devotion to amateur sport. A former Kingston and District Sports Hall of Fame board member for 21 years, Hank served as our president for five. Hank Kelly. Bruce Landon and his brother Terry is here on his behalf. Bruce has devoted his life to hockey, first as a goaltender in the Church Athletic League, before leaving Kingston to play junior hockey in Chatham, and then for Roger Nielsen's Peterborough Peets. In the 1969 NHL Amateur Draft, he was selected by the Los Angeles Kings. Bruce was sent to play for the Springfield Kings of the American Hockey League, where he won a championship in 1971, before joining the New England Whalers of the World Hockey Association, from 72 to 77, where he won an Avco Cup championship in his very first year. After a career-ending injury, Bruce moved back to Springfield, where he became involved in sales, marketing, and public relations for the team. And in 1982, at the age of 32, he became general manager of the club, guiding Springfield to the Calder Cup in 1990 and again in 91. Three years later, he became part owner of the newly named Springfield Falcons and for 20 seasons was president and general manager before becoming director of hockey operations in 2014. In 2016 and 17, Bruce played a large role in bringing a local ownership group together to keep the team in Springfield and eventually the Portland, Maine franchise moved to Springfield. Bruce retired in 2017. He was named the league's marketing director of the year in 1980, the American Hockey League's Outstanding Executive Award in 89, and was given the Thomas Ebright Award for his significant career contributions to the American Hockey League. Bruce was also inducted into the American Hockey League Hall of Fame in 2016 and the Massachusetts Hall of Fame in 2014. I might add that in 2016, he had a street in Springfield named in his honor for his decades of dedication to hockey in Springfield. Bruce Landon. Thank you, Terry. Mike McCullough and his mom, Ann, is with us this evening. Mike made his name as a star football player in Kingston playing for the Holy Cross Crusaders. And after a five-year high school career, Mike went on to play for the St. Francis Xavier X-Men. He was named defensive all-star in his senior year where he recorded 45 tackles, five quarterback sacks, and was first in the Atlantic University Football Conference with 12 tackles for lost yardage. In 2003, Mike was drafted by the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, where in his rookie year, led the team in special team tackles with 16 
And in the 2004 playoffs, Mike recorded four special teams tackles in the Canadian Football League's West Division playoff semifinal and three special team tackles in the West Division final. In 2006, Mike started 13 regular season games at middle linebacker, a position usually reserved for Americans. That year, he finished with 33 tackles, three special team tackles, and a pair of quarterback sacks. And in 2007, Mike started two games at middle linebacker and dressed in both playoff games as well as the Grey Cup. Mike retired in 2014 after 11 seasons and 185 games in the Canadian Football League. Mike was also a five-year captain of the Riders. In all, he totaled 187 defensive tackles, 113 special team tackles, 11 quarterback sacks, and he had one interception. He is a two-time Grey Cup winner with the Rough Riders, capturing the fabled mug in 2007 and 2013. Mike was also the recipient of the 2008 and 2009 Mosaic Community Award presented annually to the Rough Rider who contributes the most to his community. And he was also the inaugural recipient of the CFL's Jake Goddar Veteran Award. Mike McCullough. Thank you, Ann. Alec Murray. Born in the United Kingdom, Alec moved to Kingston with his family in 1954, and when he was 10 years old, he has committed more than 50 years to the local sports scene as an athlete, coach, referee, and a volunteer. Alec was a multi-sport athlete while in school at Kiwi CBI, and upon graduation, he was recruited to run cross-country and track at Mankato State College in Minnesota, lettering there for three years. And after graduating college, Alec returned to Kingston and his former high school and taught there for 30 years. He coached basketball, football, track, and even cheerleading. Upon his retirement from teaching, Alec returned to coaching at Holy Cross, winning a Junior Girls City Basketball Championship in 2011, and he closed out his coaching career at Regiopolis Notre Dame in 2015. He was a basketball referee and a good one for many years, and he served as president, interpreter, evaluator, and liaison between the local referees association and all the coaches. He also organized minor officials for the high school finals. Alec also served as a volunteer referee with the local Special Olympics tournament every winter. From 1983 to 85, Alec coached the women's basketball team at St. Lawrence College, winning an Ontario championship. Some of the awards Alec has won include the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation Excellence in Education Award, that came in 1990, and in 1998 he won the Investors Group Volunteer Sports Administrators Award. The Ontario Association of Basketball Officials Award of Merit in 2013, and then in 2016, he was given an honorary life membership by the Kingston District Board of Approved Basketball Officials. Alec Murray. Thank you, Alec. Well, there you have it, Mayor Patterson and members of council, the newest members of the Kingston and District Sports Hall of Fame the illustrious group now totals 173. Once again, thank you for this forum for the first public unveiling of the latest group of inductees. And we now ask that the inductees, family, and friends, and members of the board head to Memorial Hall for some fellowship and refreshments. Thank you very much.
thank you very much, and again, congratulations to all of this year's inductees. So with that, we will move on in our agenda. We have no delegations this evening, so we will move to briefings. We do have one briefing. Uh, Luke Folwell, Director of Recreation and Leisure Services, will provide introductory remarks and introduce Lynn Carlotto, General Manager of the Rogers K Rock Center, who will brief council with respect to Clause 2 of Report Number 10, received from the CAO Rogers K Rock Center 2018 Annual Plan. Mr. Falwell. Mayor Patterson, members of council, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Lynn Carlotto, who uh, I've had uh, the honor of working with over the last year and a half as our group has. Uh, begun the, the journey with SMG and the Rogers K Rock Center, and uh, I won't steal any of the excitement that she's going to provide to you, so if I'd ask Lynn to join me. Mayor Patterson, members of council, thank you for this opportunity to review and preview operations at Rogers K Rock Center. 2017, the years fly by fast. It was another great year for the Kingston Frontenacs. We know that it was a great, thrilling end of season and playoff round. We're looking forward to the same sort of activity this year. On the concert side, our venue continues to attract and secure major events that are touring in the industry. There were a number of uh, various events that occurred, everything from the Long Island Medium to Country, uh, Bob Dylan, Elton John. It was quite an active and varied year for us. Our venue's reputation, it's sterling, and it continues to be. We do have a very strong entertainment market here. It's known, Kingston fans buy tickets. We have a very dedicated fan base supporting the Kingston Frontenacs. We do have an, an impressive list of accolades that we've received from industry publications on the performance of the venue. The Kingston Frontenac game operations, promotions, and marketing is really second to none in the league. They do a fabulous job and create a great environment for families and fans. Our event presentation on all of the events that we do as well has a reputation within the industry as being solid, reliable, and very professional. It's not only what happens inside the venue, it's, it's outreach into the community. This year we spent a, more of a focus on getting out and visiting students, finding out what students are interested in, and more of an outreach to connect them with our venue. That meant getting out to Queen's University and St. Lawrence College to promote events, to do very specific promotions around specific activities, and also to hold job fairs, looking to bring students in as employees as well as interns. We also do a number of community events. I'm listing just two here. The March break public skating has continued to grow year over year. It's very popular. We bring in hundreds of people a day during the, uh, during the break and have found that it's an incredibly fun family event. We also did summer camp ball hockey for the YMCA for the first time this past summer. Summertime, not very busy in the industry. It's a great opportunity for us to open the venue up to organizations to use for camps. Everybody is interested in data these days, and, and we're like we are as well. I thought it would be interesting to share some of our data points with you. As you'd expect, most of the people who are viewing our website are in Kingston. Again, the second most popular, uh, or the second highest number of folks, are in Montreal, which I've always found is interesting. Nonetheless, it's a, it's a pattern that's remained. Mostly female. The age brackets are very even from 25 to 65. If you get into the individual demographic groups, 25, 34, 35, 45, et cetera, you'd find that it's approximately 20%, 20%, 20%. And then you look and see 19% or 55 to 65. So that says to me that we have a very broad audience. We're reaching, uh, we're reaching the market and we're 
getting the penetration that we need within all of the different fan groups that are out there. Computer preferences seems to be all about Apple. And of those Apple users, Chrome is the preferred browser. This was a year where a very interesting event came in and, and really took, everybody's, took everybody by, the, by surprise, that being the I Love the 90s show. It was created in a tremendous amount of buzz. It was a very active event. It brought fans into the building that I don't think had been there before. One of our missions is always to program a wide variety of events so that we have the opportunity to bring just about anybody into the building. In addition, you'd expect Elton John and Teresa Caputo, the Long Island medium. So, February 2018, 10th year anniversary already. Over the course of the past nine years, we've welcomed over two million fans into the venue, over 1,100 events, and knowing that our events occur in the fall, winter, and early spring, we're bringing people into the market during a period of time that would otherwise be pretty quiet from a tourism perspective. When you combine the events at Rogers K Rock Center along with the already popular summer, we now have a very well-rounded year and happy to see the economic impact that this activity brings to the city. Naming rights. This is the year we're out for the 2018 Naming Rights Sponsorship. We're doing sales prospecting through a sales agency as well as internal personnel. We're targeting local, regional, and national companies. When we go out to sponsors and make presentations, what we're offering them is solid. We know through a very specific valuation process that there is almost 250 million impressions a year. That's people who see the building through broadcast, through advertising, through free media, from driving by, from coming to events. We have a successful and award-winning venue that's highly publicized. Sponsors want to associate their brand with success, another very positive attribute. Finally, I'm leaving the quote from Riley O'Connor, the chairman of Live Nation Canada, on the screen as a good summary of our activity over the years, the value of the venue to a prospective sponsor, and also to the city of Kingston. Riley states, K-Rock was the best city investment made to serve a broad community, engage a community in a wide range of events in downtown location that provides a positive economic impact and a host of benefits to suppliers, restaurants, hotels, and employment. We have done quite a number of shows with Live Nation. We've been a very successful market for them. And I'm very proud to say that our venue really secures a great number of Live Nation events. And as stated by the chairman of that very successful company, the city of Kingston certainly made a great decision nine years ago. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Councillor Neal. Thank you. Uh, I noticed you mentioned uh, naming rights, and I look forward to uh, that being something you can check off your list soon, hopefully. Um, my question regards uh, the recent news that uh, there's a Canadian holding company, I believe, that purchased uh, your company, including both U.S. and Canadian operations. Um, do you foresee that uh, changing whatsoever uh, your operations? Sometimes holding companies purchase and then break up a company. But do you? Uh, how do you see that potentially impacting your company? Having no impact at all, locally, regionally, corporately, personnel. Uh, there will be no changes to any of our operations. Uh, the, this ownership change is really a statement of the, um, the value of SMG 
And the purchase is all about what the SMG brand is, all of our operations, all of our folks. So there is going to be no impact on, on any of us. Thank you, and I'm not gonna bring up what I always bring up, which is dark days, because I know you're working on adding additional concerts and shows. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Councillor Strapp. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, on the issue of naming rights, so, so they've extended, it says here, uh, they've extended until June, the end of June 2018. That's uh, past the original end of the contract. Is that something that could be extended again? Should we have, should there be a delay in finding a new naming rights sponsor? Or like, what are the various possibilities that could happen here? Right now, there are a number of conversations that are taking place with current and also prospective sponsors. It would be premature to anticipate, but I can tell you that there's active conversations taking place with all of those. Councillor Kandon. Thank you, through you. Uh, just as a quick comparison, can you compare kind of the success of uh, uh, this establishment compared to other cities? It would appear as though we're doing quite well and maybe uh, some people might be selling a short when they look at the success of this organization. Um, when you look at other cities, I think people will be very uh, happy with what we have here. Um, but sometimes I think that that might tend to get overlooked and, and there might be a different narrative. This venue has been very successful financially from the very beginning. And in comparison to other like facilities in the country, certainly there are very few that generate profits, let alone profits uh, of, the, uh, of the size that are generated here. So I think it's something that can be uh, taken a look at on a very specific basis if in a comparison with other buildings, but for like size, we really are a very successful building in every measurement. And that is certainly true in terms of revenue generation. Okay, Councillor Hutchison. Thank you, Your Worship. Just looking at the proposed 2018 budget, you're projecting more revenues, in, or slightly more revenues. It's sort of in stasis there for 2018 is versus 17, even though you saw um, something like a 20 odd percent drop this year over your proposed budget the year before. So on what grounds do you feel that you will be able to attract that level of uh, revenue from uh, event, events? It's always a dynamic process. We're in conversations about events that will take place in the current year, the following year, and even years beyond that. So we know how much activity there has been in the books, what we're projecting, and what we have out there right now for tentatives. So that gives us the basis where we draw those projections. Of course, as it happened this year, not every time do all of those events come through. So there can be that variance because of unanticipated delays in a tour going out at all, or an artist that suddenly decides they wanna go back in the studio, or any of the other elements that we would have no control over. But right now, from what we look at and what we're anticipating, we do see that growth. Um, for a few years now, the um it's being argued in these presentations that uh, artists were not as interested as going out on the road, and I take it that this year was a demonstration of that. The, so I guess what I'm wondering is what dynamic, economic dynamic is making it so that you can project that more artists will want to be um, touring in this coming year. We have, industry resources. We do very consistent lobbying and networking within the industry. SMG has a very strong network, very strong corporate support in knowing what the activity is projected to be. The artists that are putting together tours, 
the artists that are looking to go out on the road, whether they're going to be in the southwest of the United States or whether they're going to be in Canada. So that intelligence is out there that we work off of. It's really a matter of timing, though. It's not, it's not the economics, necessarily, that are keeping artists off the road. A few years ago, when the Canadian dollar really wavered, that had a very pronounced effect on us. That really hasn't been the case. Last year was much more a touring year or a touring cycle for U2, Paul McCartney, Tim and Faith, Garth Brooks, artists that unfortunately we won't be able to attract here because of our size. So when the industry skews in that direction, we'll find that we don't have as many events. When there's smaller events, you may end up having more of them, but you also may end up having fewer fans because by the nature of the show, they may have a smaller fan base. So there's always a number of different criteria and, and different things at play. Just one more question. Um, you know, it's noted in the introductory introduction to the report that suite revenue is down. And I was wondering what the reason for that is. I mean, I take it that people pay for the suite and the number of events is does, that, does the number of events affect the suite revenue? That's my technical question. And number two, I guess my concern is if suite revenue is going down, does that show some level of failure to thrive? <laughs> okay. My question exactly to our salespeople. And the answer is we have all of our suite contracts out for multiple years. There are a number that came up for renewal all at the same time. We didn't get 100% renewal, which is real life, but we do have uh, lots of sales that have taken place. Actually, there are two more sales that have occurred since this report was compi compiled. So it's a fluid situation. It has absolutely no reflection on the building itself, our programming, it's really just more of a sales cycle. Thank you, and I hope you do well. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other questions, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so uh, moving on, uh, are there any petitions to present tonight? Okay, seeing none, uh, we do have uh, two motions of condolence. First moved by Mayor Patterson, seconded by Deputy Mayor Bohm, that the sincere condolences of Kingston City Council be extended to Amber Scott, Kingston Fire and Rescue Communication Technician, on the passing of her husband, Rob Scott, who passed away on Saturday, December 30th, 2017. Our thoughts are with the Scott family during this difficult time. Moved by Mayor Patterson, seconded by Deputy Mayor Bohm, that the condolences of Kingston City Council be extended to Joanne Griffin, Executive Assistant with the City of Kingston, on the passing of her mother, Maude Horwood. Our thoughts are with Joanne and her family during this difficult time. So we will call the vote, please. Please vote. And that carries. Okay, we have no deferred motions this evening, so we will move on to reports. First up, we have report number 10 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Stroud, second by Deputy Mayor Bohm, that report number 10 from the Chief Administrative Chief Administrator of Officer Consent be received and adopted. So there are five clauses. Are there any separations? Councillor Holland? Number three. three. Councillor Stroud? Number four, please. Okay. So first we will vote on the balance of the items. So first, Clause 1, 2018 Municipal Borrowing Bylaw. Clause 2, Rogers K. Rock Center 2018 Annual Plan. And Clause 5, Council Support of a Conditional Grant Agreement from the Eastern Ontario Development Fund. Please vote.
and that carries. Clause three, Bell Park Working Group Update. Councillor Holland. Thank you, Your Worship, uh, and through you. The, um, I was curious about the composition of the committee, uh, the new working group, I suppose, uh, and had, had the chance to discuss with staff today, but just for the benefit of anyone who is interested, um, when we had the discussion around the potential for the new site there was a, and the uh, engagement process, there was a great deal of interest expressed through the course of the process at ARC and at Council um, from two sports groups in particular, the uh, rugby group and Pickleball Association. And so I was curious about the representation on this working group and to what extent those groups would be represented or if there would be a way of ensuring that there was um, a sort of equal or fair representation of various recreational groups or sporting groups in the city. So I've had the opportunity to discuss with staff and I'm just curious and would like to hear their response um, either from, from Commissioner Hurdler or from the clerk's office who have been helpful on this one. Mr. Falwell. Through you, Your Worship, um, in, in response to the Councillor's question, uh, we'd be working with the Clerk's Department to identify on the application process uh, any sports affiliation to ensure that there would be uh, that, that broader representation throughout the working group. Okay, so we will call the vote on Clause 3. And that carries. Clause four, Grass Creek Park washroom and change room renovation. Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Your Worship. So at, at first glance, it seemed like the, uh, the, the amount of money being asked here, uh, you know, there's a bit of sticker shock at first, but then I, when I read through the report, I saw several uh, positives, and I just sort of wanted to ask the director to explain for folks watching uh, some of those positives. So for one thing, the city contribution, as I understand it, is a matching contribution of uh, something that is coming from the Pittsburgh uh, fund. Could you just explain that? Uh, is that so the funding would be 50-50 for the upgrade? Mr. Fowell. Through you, Your Worship, uh, yes, very close. Uh, the Pittsburgh Community Benefit Fund uh, has contributed or will be contributing uh, close to $500,000, so actually more than 50% of the $900,000 price tag uh, where the city would be funding the $401,000 for, for that total. So, yeah, certainly a very positive and a, and a good partnership we're looking, looking forward to uh, move forward with. Thank you. And then the other thing that was kind of exciting was the design of the new building that incorporates the wooden structure that was down by Ann Gorda Moore Park in my district that housed the Phoebe. And there's a picture on page 49, that sh there's a sketch there you can see in your package. The original wooden st structure was quite pretty and it was bu built by uh, students of uh, local high schools, QECVI I believe, and uh, a lot of volunteer work went into that structure and it wasn't trashed, it was put in storage, that's in the report. So if you could just explain how that will be integrated into the uh, new washroom structure. Through you, Your Worship, uh, as indicated in the image, that's just a concept that this, this state uh, will be moving forward with design services to integrate it. So uh, not exactly sure how it's going to look in the end, uh, but we wanted to recognize and we had received some previous council direction to, to uh, reinstate that structure in Grass Creek Park when the Phoebe was relocated from the, uh, its former site. Uh, so we're, we're excited about it, and uh, certainly there's a lot of value attached to that post and beam structure. Uh, it was very closely and, and, uh, and carefully monitored during its disassembly and has been in heated, heated storage since. Uh, so uh, we, we hope to make as best use as possible and show off as much of that craftsmanship as we can at Grass Creek Park once the renovations of the washroom building and change rooms are complete. Just uh, so one further detail. So on that, it was an open air structure for the Phoebe. Is it possible that, it will, will it be an open air structure automatically or is it possible it could be incorporated with walls attached with the same sort of roof and, and post structure? 
through your worship, we're not, we haven't finalized the details. Uh, the intent is to keep some of it as an open structure so that people can enjoy some of that craftsmanship that's there. Uh, it, it'd be a shame to cover up um, all that uh, excellent uh, woodwork. Uh, some of it may be covered up depending on the size and the configuration of the space, but the intent is to try and retain as much of that as possible. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Councillor Osterhoff. Thank you, Mayor. And through you, um, <clears throat> I do want to uh, echo the words of Councillor Stroud, too. I think this is an exciting um, opportunity that we have, and, and I can tell you as uh, representing Countryside, it's um, something that I, I appreciate Ryan's support in this, too, uh, um, for his area. And uh, this has been something that the community has really wanted for a while, and uh, I heard it loud and clear, and uh, I really want to thank uh, Luke Falwell and all the city staff for helping move this forward, and Gene Cooper as well, chair of the the Pittsburgh Community Benefit Fund has done a lot of work, and this has been a, a plan that's sort of been sort of stalled, and, and now it's moving forward, and uh, I'm excited about it, and uh, I just want to thank everybody for what the role they're playing and, and kind of fast-tracking it as best as we can for the events that are held there that uh, really can represent Kingston well, and uh, I'm excited and proud that this is moving forward. I want to thank everybody. Thank you. Okay, we will call the vote on Clause 5, please. And that carries. Report number 11 from Heritage Kingston. Your Worship, I rise to uh, submit report number 11 from Heritage Kingston, uh, moved and seconded. You'll find the details in the package. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Stroud, second by Councillor Shell, that report number 11 from Heritage Kingston be received and adopted. So there are a number of items under both the statutory and non-statutory consultation. Would anyone like any of the items separated? Okay, seeing none, we will vote on them as a whole, please. Please vote. And that carries. Report number 12 from Committee of the Whole. My apologies, I lost count. Uh, I have a motion uh, from Committee of the Whole, duly moved and seconded. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Neal and seconded by Councillor Osanek that report number 12 from the Committee of the Whole be received and adopted. So is there's just the one item, transmittal of the Economic Development Organization 2017 Performance Review Working Group Report. We'll call the vote, please. And that carries. Uh, we have no information reports, no information reports from members of council. Miscellaneous business, we do have one motion that the resignation of Peter Goheen from Heritage Kingston be received with regret. Can I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor Stroud. Please vote. And that carries. Okay, we have one new motion on the agenda, moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor Stroud. Whereas it is understood that there is a desire by the property owner to demolish or remove portions of a stone wall, which would appear to exist within portions of 79 to 81, 85 and 87 Queen Street, 232 to 234 and 236 Wellington Street, and 88, 90, 92 and 96 Barrick Street. And whereas the Ontario Heritage Act provides options for the conservation of property and structures the council believes to have heritage uh, value or interest, and whereas the city's Heritage Properties Working Group has, through preliminary research, identified that the stone wall may be more than 150 years old and could provide contextual information on the historic use of the property and accordingly appears to have cultural heritage value, therefore be it resolved that Council direct staff to undertake the necessary steps to add the property or properties on which the stone wall sits to the Heritage Register as a listed, non-designated property, properties of cultural heritage value, 
and that subsequent to the listing of the property, council directs staff to identify the review of the stone wall as a priority, delay work on other designations as required, and retain a professional heritage consultant to complete a review of the stone wall against Ontario Regulation 906, criteria for determining cultural heritage value or interest. And that funding be drawn from the Planning, Building, and Licensing Department's 2018 approved budget for heritage designations to support the retention of a professional heritage consultant for the purposes of the aforementioned 906 review. And that Council direct staff to report back to Heritage Kingston with findings from the professional heritage consultant's 906 review. Councillor Hutchison. Thank you, Your Worship. As the motion says, this wall is thought to be around 150 years old and possibly more. It's important in the context of our city's history. I have a series of thank yous in pursuing this, um, other than the residents that pointed it out to me. I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Stroud and Councillor Shell for direction and guidance on this matter. I'd like to thank the legal department. Before bringing this proposal to the Heritage Working Group, there were a few private property issues to be examined. Those issues are still outstanding and the city has no position on them. The importance of this stone wall lies in its potential historical and heritage value to our community. In a preliminary analysis, a member of the legal department took a look at early 19th century historical plans of the area and felt the wall was possibly worth, worthy of heritage consideration. I'd like to thank the commissioner, Ms. Hurdle, and the planning department, and who at my request drafted the motion you see before you and did some preliminary assessment of the situation and offered guidance. And I'd like to thank the Heritage Working Group and especially member Helen Finley. Uh, a private heritage planner was requested by Ms. Finley to take a preliminary look at the situation and the planner estimated the wall to date back to at least to the 1892-1904 fire insurance plan and that the 1850 plan, quote, likely shows the wall, unquote. Research by members of the working group indicates that there may be, quote, good evidence that the wall predates 1850, unquote. Private research by a lawyer and surveyor with experience in historical property issues concludes, quote, that the wall structure originates more than 200 years ago and is part of a larger network of historic stone wall structures that are located in the same city block that forms part of the original downtown core of the city of Kingston, unquote. The functional heritage value of this stone is being variously estimated <laughs> or uh, speculated on, and, um, and it relates to its possible various uses over the centuries as a boundary fence and or parts of buildings of residential, commercial, and even military uses. The motion for council seeks to begin the process of evaluate, evaluating the heritage significance of the stone wall so that the city, including council, may make an informed decision on its place in our cultural fabric. I believe the stone wall, especially its apparent interconnection with historical, the historical network of stone walls in our city, is more than worthy of our consideration. For that reason, I urge council to vote for this motion and beginning this evaluation process. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Councillor Schell. Uh, thank you, Mayor Patterson. First, a uh, couple of questions. It does mention that um, this is within the budget. Could you um, uh, give me an idea of what this would cost uh, for the uh, designation consultant, please? So through you, Mr. Mayor, the, uh, the cost to actually complete the work has been estimated at about $2,500. We do set aside funds every year for heritage designations that are outside of larger uh, plans that we have. Um, this year, I believe we have about $30,000 in the uh, capital budget for various uh, types of minor designations. Uh, thank you for that. Um, when Councillor Hutchison brought this up, many of us went down to take a look at the wall because we'd never noticed it before. Uh, it's in the back of the Staples uh, parking lot, and uh, I was quite surprised to see it and the arch um, that's there and that there's uh, some damage to the wall, which uh, makes sense over time. Um, and in the investigations uh, that were started, which are 
done by volunteers generally. So we're getting our information from some very smart volunteers in the city of Kingston, but I can see why hiring a consultant to start getting some real answers about this wall would be uh, a very good idea. Um, the wall actually seems to be part of a series of walls. That would be one of the things that would be answered, I hope, by a consultant that uh, end, seems to end in a four foot wide, about 12 foot high limestone wall that none of us had ever noticed before on Wellington Street between two brick um, sort of rows of townhouses. So it, uh, it is quite fascinating that it could be part of um, the uh, military uh, section of Kingston, that, you know, Barrack Street, this is where the military were originally. Uh, we just don't know. Um, and there aren't many of this type of wall left in the city of Kingston. You know, there's some near Panchancho, there's the, uh, the interior uh, courtyard um, leading to Panchancho, as well as in a, a sort of 12, 15 foot high stone wall there, but they, they're kind of rare. Um, so I think this is well worth uh, investigating uh, for a possible designation. So I will certainly support the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I also went down and had a look initially at the invent invitation of mover, uh, Councillor Hutchison, it's in his ward. Uh, with the vice chair of the Heritage Committee. And, uh, you know, at, at first glance, you, you notice the, the arch, the center arch that has a wooden door in place, and then it was in the summer that we looked at it, the, um, or the fall, I guess. It, the bottom of the door is actually uh, buried be, from, from buildup uh, over the years uh, the, on both sides. Uh, so that door is obviously not opened in, in many years. But, it, but it's still there and it's sort of evocative of, of a passageway that, and we have no idea when it was used as a door and what the door was for. Uh, this, this wall is obviously very old when you look at it and, and you notice the contrast between the two sides. So the side facing Queen Street, the owner there has obviously uh, put some recent money into the, into the upkeep of the wall. You can see that in, in recent uh, masonry work and the wall looks great on that side. And on the other side, unfortunately, where it's, it, it's falling down, uh, you see that there hasn't been any recent work there. And if you go there today, you'll, you'll notice large piles of snow pushed up against the wall from clearing the parking lot that's behind it. So you'll, not, you'll, you'll notice that contrast on the two sides of the wall. Uh, but as Councillor Shell was saying, if you follow it along, it goes up to this high four foot wide uh, wall, a stone wall that's, that's, you know, the hot, tallest stone wall in Kingston, if you look at it that way, uh, of its age. And you wonder, what it, what is this uh, a remnant of? It, it's, it's, it could be actually older than anything else in the block. So, um, like, like she said, that's why we need the expert. Initially, I thought that consultant work would be much more expensive than $2,500, so I was wondering, what you guys would have to say about that, about the cost, but I think at, at $2,500, that, that is within the budget we already have for heritage work for designation. So I just had a question for the commissioner, a further question. In the, in the second clause, it says, um, council direct staff to identify the review of the stone wall as a priority, delay work on other designations as required. So. What does that mean? Because that affects the work that the committee oversees. This, by the way, this, this issue has not come to the Heritage Committee. It's not been discussed by the Heritage Committee. Um, what, what kind of, what, what does that mean? Delay work on other designations as required. Are we talking about significant delays to other designation work here? Commissioner Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So as, uh, as I, I know you're very aware, Councillor Strout, we have a number of properties that have been listed and we're working through designations gradually and working through, uh, through them with the Heritage Committee. So what we would be looking at doing is most likely putting one of those on, on hold until we can actually do the work on this particular uh, designation as requested by council. So I just we just wanted to make sure that council was aware that it could have an impact on some of the work that's being done on other designations. Okay, and then there's the aspect that I know, um, actually it was in this, uh, the, the motion we just passed from the Heritage Committee. At the last meeting we talked about a change to the Heritage Grants bylaw. Uh, but, but just to sort of uh, point out, 
or to ask the question, uh, could the work um, for the repair work for the masonry, could that be uh, possibly eligible for a heritage grant if the wall was subject to a designation? Commissioner Hurdle. Thank you, and through you. So <clears throat> off the top of my head, because I don't have all the criterias in front of me for, for the grant program, um, I would say um, most likely it would be if it was designated. Um, but I would want to make sure that we do, our staff have the chance to do a full review before uh, confirming that. Right, and uh, if you'll notice in the detail of that grants bylaw that we just passed, it's actually the director of planning uh, that uh, oversees the grants program and there's criteria and selection process criteria. It's basically a policy that gets implemented by the director now rather than something that gets approved by the Heritage Committee anymore. So that's, a, that's the, that change. So I guess the point is, is that the work on the crumbling side of the wall that is causing the controversy, first of all, is not that much more pricey than the consultant cost of 2,500. It might be up, maybe 5,000, might be 10,000, but we'd have to get an estimate on that and that the owner's unwilling to pay that amount. We know that. But with a grant, obviously, that situation might change. I think when you put it all together, the, the small price to pay for a piece of Kingston's history, and although I can see reasons to do due diligence, I am going to support the motion. Thank you. Thank you. So we will call the vote then on new motion number one. Please vote. And that carries. Are there any notices of motion? Seeing none, uh, Madam Deputy Clerk, last for minutes, please. Moved by Councillor Neal, second by Councillor Holland, that the minutes of City Council meeting number 2018-02, held Tuesday, December 19th, 2017, be confirmed. Please vote. And that carries. Some tabling of documents and number of communications. Is there any other business? Madam Deputy Clerk, ask for bylaws, please. Moved by Councillor Osanek, second by Councillor Shell, that bylaws one through four and 15 through 27 be given their first and second reading. Please vote. That carries. Moved by Councillor Osanek and seconded by Councillor Shell that Clause 11.34, Bylaw Number 2010-1, be suspended for the purpose of giving Bylaw 15 three readings. Please vote. And that carries. Moved by Councillor Osanek and seconded by Councillor Shell that bylaws 5 through 27 be given their third reading. Please vote. And that carries. Motion to adjourn, please. Moved by Deputy Mayor Bohm, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff. Please vote. And we are adjourned. Thank you very much.